got your Bibles, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, shall we? Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 12, and uh, verses 1 through 4. God has got me where I am. And 
and to be a blessing and a ministry to, to others as well. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. I should read the Bible so I let you guys sit down with me. Amen. Oh, amen out of my life. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That's not what I'm preaching about. It's good, and probably another time I will. This second verse is where I'm going to take my context from today. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your own minds. In other words, when you take a look at what Jesus endured for your sakes, yes. why are you whining about what exactly. goes on in your own life? Right. Exactly. That's paraphrasing, right? <laughs> You'll realize I'm paraphrasing that. Okay. Um, and then it says in verse 4, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we just love you so very much. I thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, for how it speaks to our hearts. God, I thank you for your presence here today. Because surely your presence is in this place. God, we, we uh, look at our own lives and sometimes in our own strength, Lord, we try so hard to do the right thing, to be right, all the different things that we consider to be important in our lives, we take care of. But Jesus, when you walk into the midst of our lives, whether it's a church service or whether we're by ourselves in our prayer closet, God, so many things become clear. Thank you, Jesus. Our perspective changes. Yes. And I thank you, Lord, for you. allowing us, Jesus, to be a part of your kingdom. What a privilege it is today to be your child. Yes, Lord. God, I pray that your presence will continue to remain. Lord, that you will just speak to your people. That their hearts and ears be receptive to your word. And God, that you will use me, Lord, to relate to them your word in such a way. God, that it will affect their lives and change them to become more like you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 And you may be seated in Jesus' name. I do want to just, uh, I notice that some of you are, are still using my uh, my old phone number. So I do want to give you this. I was actually going to do it before I started. Just notice that I had written it down here. For those of you that need to contact me while I'm away, uh, my phone number, if you want to write this down, is 425-327-6330. And it is going to be long distance because it is a U.S. phone number. So if you don't want to call, just text me and say, can you call me, Brother Nickel? And, uh, and I will give you a call and uh, be able to hopefully address whatever it is that you need in your life at that time. Amen. I want to continue to pastor. Yes. 425-327-6330. Uh, and I have to look at it, too, because I still don't know. Amen. And uh, so, if you want to get in touch with me, please, 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 don't hesitate, okay? Everybody said amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. What are you looking at? What? Looking at me? You. Have you ever noticed that, how many of you guys, when you were back in school, now this is a very common thing whenever you're trying to, trying to get yourself into a fight or something. You look at another person. What are you looking at? Yeah. You looking at me? You know what? Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at you. You're ugly or something. <laughs> and before long, you're out in the back forty somewhere, exchanging punches and whatever, you know. And uh, and it was a or you know, you're, I grew up with three brothers. And uh, and man, if one of them looked at you wrong, you were wanting to you know get in a fight with them and. Uh, and uh, now my sons were never like that. They were always perfect. But um, 
Sort of. <laughs> Not quite. Um, what we look at so affects what we do with our lives that, think of it this way. For most of us, I'm, I'm assuming all of us, and so I'll include everybody into this category, most of us have a brain. <laughs> you all agree? That brain keeps within it the things that you input into your life. So what you look at, what you read, will so affect it that in times down the road, you will have something that you will see that will, will bring this whole set of memories back to you again because of something that you've inputted into your life. Now, I'm not going to really talk about, about all the things that we should or should not watch or look at because that's not what, what I want to preach to you about today. But just as a side point on this, be careful what you put in front of your eyes. I remember as a Sunday school child, uh, we used to sing that, that chorus, Be careful little eyes what you see. Uh, there's a father up above who's looking down in love, so be careful little eyes what you see. And we always did that in Sunday school, and I, you know, I never really dawned on me. You see how memories come back to you? Yeah. Uh, that, that never really dawned on me what that was talking about. As a child, you just have no idea. But as you grow up, you begin to understand a little bit more of the things that were instilled as a child, now they start to come back again and I realize what it's talking about. With every act of violence you see, it, it changes you. Right. With every act of lust that you look at, it changes your mind and your concept of what's right and what's wrong. It's no wonder in this day and age that, that, that we, we talk about the, you know, the evils of, of what's on TV. Honestly. If any of you know a TV show that doesn't deal in adultery and various other things that are wrong, I'd like to know about it because there's not very many on there. Yeah. Yeah. But for the more that things that you watch, for the more things that you instill in you, the more it changes your thinking to make you believe that this is commonplace and that this is okay. Right. Right. So it changes your perception of reality until you believe that what you see is real. And I know the common argument in our generation is, do we affect what, what media shows us, or does the media affect the way that we are, and the morals, and the integrity, and the various things of our society? And I would have to tell you that, that the media has always been at the forefront, leading the way. There may be a, 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 just a little bit of something going on, but the media will bring it out and put prominence in front of us, right. and make it seem commonplace. Let's, let's believe the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Let's base what we want and what we desire for our lives on the Word of God. We uh, just recently, we had our family up in Mount Washington, and a lady came down and was, uh, or came up there and was taking pictures of our family. And many of you have seen the pictures uh, on Facebook or wherever. But she, she said to, uh, this is my wife or my daughter-in-law, I can't remember which, that when she was up there, she, she had myself and my wife and, and our five children, all of us, all, my whole family was all together, but she had just our, our base family there. And then she said to us, everybody act normal. And, and my boys, and now, you know, that's probably not something you want to do for most families, but my boys and, and my kids and all of us, you know, they just started grabbing and hugging each other. And, and she's back behind the camera and she said, she was, she was almost crying because she said she wished that her family could be that way. Yeah. 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 Do you know why that is? Because because we've decided that we want to base our, our lives and our family life on this. Yeah. Yeah. Not, on, not on the things that, that the world would have us to be. We want to base it on what God wants us to be. And what a great thing that is. And I don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not bragging about me or us, because my wife has been the one that has held this all together because I'm always off working somewhere. So, And uh, I want to brag on her. She raised these kids to know God, and I thank God for that. Amen. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful what you set your sight on and what you look at, because it will affect you and it will change you, and it will affect how you look at others and how you look at your life. Right. Amen. If there's also makes a difference not only what we look at, but how we look at things. 
Everybody with me? Yeah. How many of you know some people that are always look at things negative? <laughs> it doesn't matter how good things are. Yeah, that's yeah. right. They're always going to find the negative part of it. Right. They're gonna, if, if everything's wonderful right now and you got a good job and the economy's going good, the children are behaving themselves for a little bit and, and uh, the relationship with your husband and wife is good, man, they're going to look down the road and say, but yeah, that's right. it could all fall apart tomorrow. Yeah, probably will. And, and they will.
did, they first thought it was a spirit. They thought it was something evil. And, and uh, so they started questioning it. And Jesus himself said to them, don't, don't be afraid. It's just me. It's, it's me walking to you across the water here. And still they weren't sure whether they believed truly that it was Jesus. And just so you know, Jesus is always going to come into our lives at those times. Right. Now, we have an opportunity when he does to ask him, Lord, if that truly is you, why don't you just put something in my heart and mind that tells me I should come to you right now? Right. And, and so Peter's in the boat and, and Jesus is walking across the sea and, and he says to Peter, it is me. And uh, come. Yeah. And Peter jumps over the gunwales of that uh, of that little boat, the fishing boat that they're crossing the sea in. And uh, he had his eyes just solely and completely fixed on Jesus when he first came. And I know that people criticize, and I know that they look at the fact that he sank. But my goodness, there hasn't been anybody else except for Jesus who's done it that I know of. That's right. Amen. And for a period of time, whether it was long or whether it was short, he walked on the water. That's right. Now, the sea did not become calm, and the wind was still blowing, and the waves were still lashing. And I don't know whether or not he went up one side of the wave and down the other, or how that worked out, or whether the Lord made it calm for him so that he was walking out on flat water. I don't know how he did it, but I know something, that when he had his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk on that water. Amen. And then the Bible says this, that he began to see and to look at the waves that were coming at him. And just for a moment, his eye, his, what he was looking at, wavered. And he saw the wind and the effect of the wind on the water in front of him. And the waves, he might have looked down at the waves lack, just splashing against his feet and his legs down below. And he took his concentration off where it should have been. Yeah. And he sank. If you're basing how you live your life right. on circumstances around you and whether or not it's good and whether or not it's bad, there is something inevitable that will happen. And you'll find this in every instance that I'm going to talk about today with our lives. That there is something absolutely inevitable that will happen to you. If you're looking at it, you're going to sink into it. That's true. That's right. That's true. If you're constantly worried about your circumstances, sooner or later your circumstances will consume you. It's inevitable that you will sink into that until it is all that you are consumed with for the rest of your life. That's right. Is whether or not it is good for you to do this, whether or not it is not good for you to do this, whether it's the right decision because of your circumstances right now, and you will be constantly consumed by those decisions in your life. It's inevitable that you will sink into that. The second thing that people often base their lives on and the decisions that they make and is looking at others. Yeah. Now, just so I want to correct something right off the bat. It's not a bad thing to look at others if you're wanting to help. Yeah. If I'm looking at somebody around me and I see a need and I want to meet that need, that's a good thing. Yeah. But if my sense of, of whether or not I'm a good person, my sense of, of whether or not I, I look good, is based upon what others think, then I'm going to be constantly, my self-worth is going to be dependent upon the approval of others in my life. What a terrible way to live our lives. Amen. It affects us in every, every part of what we do. Because if I can get approval from somebody, I'm going to end up wanting to do that so that they can have, I can have praise of those people and feel better about myself. That's right. Before long, that's all we're consumed with, is what others think about us. Everything we do then, if we're looking at others for our sense of self-worth, uh, everything we do, the decisions that we make, is predicated on how we will be received with the decisions that we make, with how we do things. It affects us in so many areas of our life that it can affect our sense of values, affect our sense of modesty, That's right. affect our sense of integrity, because we want the approval 
of those that are around us. Now, don't get me wrong on this. I want to be good looking. my wife, I always will be, no matter how old I get. <laughs> but if everything that I do is based upon whether or not I think you are, then today I would probably have a toupee on. <laughs> and I probably would have spent more time in the gym. You know, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with me. I told that my, my nephew this last week, he goes to the gym every day, Preston does. And so he's getting me a workout routine to help me lose weight. And so he had me doing one where, where I've got this weights and I'm in the crouch and I gotta raise it, you know, so that you're doing this, right? And so I said, the only problem with this is, is that I was standing in front of a mirror. Every time I stood up, my t-shirt came up. He says, I can see my, you know, my belly, you know, and he says, you just keep doing this and it'll get better. Yeah. And I made the statement to him, I said, I'm not really interested in the big muscles or, you know, all the rest of these things that everybody else is. I just don't want to get useless and, you know, so I can't do anything anymore. I want to make sure I stay healthy enough to do stuff, right? And he says, oh, we'll get you there. So he's going to get you there. So, I'm a little frightened because if you saw some of the things that he did, you know, before long your pastor's going to come up. <laughs> I'll be flexing just so you can see how uh, many weights I've been lifting during the past week. For myself, I want to be healthy. For myself, I want to be fit enough that, that 10 years from now, I, I can still be snowboarding if I want to. Right. But how well you look is not dependent on the Glamour magazine or the men's magazine that you just read or looked at because if all we're looking at it is what others think of us or what others tell us that we should be. I'll tell you something, you're never going to be very happy with the way that you are. That's the truth. say amen. 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 Hallelujah. It can affect us in so, so many other areas of our life uh, as far as how we live for God. It can affect us to the degree that, that if we don't have others around us lifting their hands and worshiping. Yeah. Yeah. Now we'll sit quietly in our seats even yeah. though we feel the power of God moving in our lives. Yeah. It can affect us in our testimony and our witness to other people. Right. Because we fear right. rejection so greatly because we're so afraid of what they might say or think of us that we never speak up and never tell them about a God that can change their lives. Because we're basing our decisions and our lives solely upon what others may or may not think of us. It will affect us that way. Uh, Jesus, or let's go back to Peter for a moment. Peter at the end of, of the Gospels uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus uh, was there with his disciples just before he ascended. And he started to talk to Peter about the sacrifice that he was going to have to make. And some of the things that he was going to encounter in his life. The Bible very specifically says this, that when Jesus was speaking to him, he was speaking to him about the death that he was going to have to encounter down the road. And that there was going to come a time when, when others would take his hands and place them where he didn't want them to go. And take him to a place. And we all know that from history that, that Peter, when he was in Rome, they were going to take him away and crucify him. And history or legend tells us that when Peter heard that he was going to be crucified, he said, would you take the crossbar from the top of that cross and put it at the bottom because I am not worthy to be crucified in the same manner my Lord was. And he hung upside down and he died on the cross. Upside down. Peter said this when Jesus said these words to him describing some of the things that he was going to go through. He immediately looked over at John and ask the question what about him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And Jesus' answer for Peter at that time is, what I do with him in his life has nothing to do with you. Follow me. Do you not see that, that if we base our lives, even our Christian walk, based upon what we think that others should do or others have done or others will do, that it will lead to such a mediocre, mediocre yes. walk with God? Yes. There will be not one person that will say, I'm going to excel in God. Amen. I'm going to be good for God. I'm going to be great for God. Because we'll always be looking at what is the common level. And we'll say, well, look at this person. They don't sacrifice this much. Look at this one. They don't, they don't give a sacrifice for foreign yes. missions. Why should I give to foreign missions? And, and we're going to have our financial meeting after the church today at 430. But, but after a while, we think to ourselves, you know what? You know, not everybody else is in giving a mortgage, but what? We base our sacrifice and our disciplines in God based upon what we think that others should or should not do. That's right. That's what we're looking at. Yeah. Is others. It's a scary thing if God's calling us to a great ministry and we decide not to do it because others before us have not done it. Yeah. yeah. Because you see what Jesus was saying, it doesn't matter. What Kevin does, I, it doesn't matter what Sam does, it doesn't matter what Colin does, it doesn't matter what anybody does, I have an obligation to follow God the way that God leads me in my life. That's right, right. Amen. So inevitably, if we are looking at others to define our walk with God or define our lives, there are some things that will absolutely be inevitable. We will not, no one will be able to tell the difference between us and anybody that's not living for God. Because we will never want to stand out. We will never want to be a light on the hill. We will never want to make a difference in somebody's life. It always will be about fitting in. Yeah, right. Mediocrity will be inevitable. We base our lives and our decisions on what others think about us. The third one is that if we're always looking at ourselves. How does this affect me? How, does, how is this decision going to affect me in my life? Yeah. And, and this is probably one of the most dangerous ways for us to live our life. How many remember the story about the uh, Lazarus and the rich man? It's actually not a story because in parables, you never use a person's name. So these were actual individuals. So Lazarus is a beggar. He's outside this rich man's gate. He's begging for alms because he doesn't have a job and he needs. Now understand that he needs money to be able to live. In Israel, it was part of their culture to take care of the poor. In fact, if you go back far enough in the Old Testament, you're going to find out that it was actually actually put down in their law that they had to put a certain amount aside to take care of the poor. This man had so much money, and yet the Bible tells us that, that this rich man would not even help the one that was outside of his gate. He wouldn't give Lazarus anything, and yet he had so much money. You want to know why? Because everything was about him. Right. He was selfish, self-centered, right. and egotistical, and it was, his whole life was based upon what was good for him. Now, if you read the rest of the story, we find out that the rich man goes into torment, Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom into reward, and the rich man looking over sees him and asks whether or not he can bring one drop of water and place it upon his tongue. There is an inevitability to where our lives will end up if our lives are centered solely upon what we want and upon ourselves and what is good for us. The inevitability of it is, is that we will lose out oh, with a God that wants us to be saved. That's right. Judas, we often wonder about this because at least I do. Anybody else ever wonder about this? How could, how could somebody, one of the twelve that had spent all that time with Jesus, actually betray him? Yeah. How could he do that? He walked with, with the Almighty God in human flesh. He saw miracles. Yeah. He saw food being multiplied, the dead raised, the lame were walking, the blind seeing, and the deaf were hearing. He saw all those things. How could he do it? The Bible says this when, when Mary came to Jesus one time and, and he's in 
he's in Simon the leper's house, and, and Mary takes a pound of a very precious, expensive ointment called spikenard. She breaks the vase and, and she begins to anoint Jesus from the top of his head all the way down to his feet. And expensive, expensive stuff. Now, Judas, this is what he said for this. He said, um, what is this waste? self-centered try and justify it by making it look like they're doing good. Yeah. But the Bible brings us right to the point. And, and it says, this is, he said this not because he cared any at all for the poor. He didn't care about anybody. Except himself. He said this because the Bible says he was a thief. Yeah. And he carried the bag of all the offerings and whatever money that came to them, Judas was the secretary of treasure. Mm -hmm. And he helped himself. He wanted this for himself. So every once in a while, I'm not sure how much, he'd take a little bit out of the bag. And then some more came in. He'd take some more out of the bag. And uh, I, I can't fathom this. Right. Now, think about this. Just, just think about this for a moment. Jesus knew people's thoughts. That's right. Because the Bible said that knowing what they were thinking, Jesus would oftentimes answer them before the question was even raised. Judas was there. Do you not think that it occurred to him that maybe Jesus knew what he was thinking and what he was doing? And yet, his sense of self and what was important to him overcame his reluctance and the thoughts that maybe, just maybe, he might get away with it. Yeah. Down the road, Matthew 26, 14, Judas asked this question of the Pharisees. What will you give me to betray you? What will you give to me? And I'll betray Jesus. You see, if our lives are based solely upon me, there's going to come some place down the road in my walk with God when the question will be asked. How much yeah. would it take for me to betray? Yeah, that's right. To walk away. To say I'm never gonna live for God again. Because something is absolutely inevitable if our lives are based upon solely at looking at ourselves and what we want. It's inevitable that sooner or later we will be betray. That's right. Sooner or later we will reach that same place that you This is pretty heavy stuff. Isn't it? So now let's go to the last one because the last one's positive. Everybody smile. Conviction has come. We can move up now to the to where we are. Hopefully. Everybody say amen. amen. The psalmist said it. He said, look to, I will look to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. It's not literally talking about hills per se. Although you could have looked at the hills around Jerusalem and gotten inspiration from them for so much of Israel's history was based upon things that happened on those hills. Moses got the law and Jesus was crucified. And so we could look and we could say, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I can look to work. But what it's talking about is where is your vision? 
If our vision is always downward, it's going to be on circumstances, it's going to be on others, or it's going to be on me. But when I begin to raise my vision so that I'm looking upwards, understand that it was talking about us looking towards the one who is able to help us, whatever our situation is. He's the one that is able to give us that sense of self-worth if we're looking at him. If you feel like there's a loss of self-worth in your life that you can't do anything for God or, or you're just so worried about what others think or you're so worried about what you get or you're so worried about your circumstances, I want you to know something today. That if we begin to get our eyes off of the things that are, are physically around us, we begin to get our eyes off of our circumstances and off of others and what they may think or off of me and what I may need and we begin to raise it up and say, Lord, I'm going to put my eyes from the Amplified, that same passage of Scripture, so that you'll just have an idea of what the interpretation of that Scripture is. So Hebrews chapter 12, first of all, it says, Therefore then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance that is unnecessary weight, and the sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us, and let us run with patience, the, with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us. Stand together, shall we, as the musicians come. Verse 2. Look at this. Looking away from all that will distract us. Looking away intentionally and deliberately from anything that would distract us. What is that? My circumstances. Have you ever noticed how your circumstances can affect how you worship? There are some that can come in here and worship God and, and man, they just feel the presence of God and, and everything's wonderful and everything's great in their life. And the person next to them doesn't feel that because they're centered in on their circumstances and what's going on in their lives right now. How much of what is around us distracts us? what God wants for our lives. Are we worried? Are you worried today about what others may think of you? If you should respond to God in such a way that you did not quench what God wants you to do. What sometimes keeps you from the altar? Is it pride, ego? That's just looking at ourselves. Is that reluctance based upon whether others may think you good or bad? Or, what? or is it based on positive or negative circumstances in your life? Can I tell you something today? That we have to deliberately look away from all that would distract us. It says looking away from all that will distract, and then very soon it says, to Jesus. When I was in Sunday school, we used to sing the chorus, Jesus loves me, this I know, yeah. or the Bible tells me so. I noticed that Tim and Kate sing it to Judah before he goes to bed. He can almost sing it himself already. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. What a great thing it is for a child to grow up Knowing that Jesus loves them. Right. Jesus is the answer. Yes, he is. It's the answer for all of our needs in our lives. Not necessarily all of our wants, but he's the answer for your needs. Praise God. I know there's so much about our world that wants us to believe that that that. That they can meet what 
we need. And it's up to whether or not I have this job or that job, or whether I go to this doctor or that job. The world would have us believe that they have the answers to whatever we need in our life. But I can tell you today, unequivocally, that they do not have the answers for what we need in our life. That's right. That if you will need something in your life, you need to, you need to turn your eyes towards Jesus. Right. You need to look upwards and say, Lord, this is where I am. This is what I need. You have the answers for my life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It's going to take something on our part. We're going to have to say, no, I'm not going to look at that. Yeah. And no, I'm not going to be concerned with what I need right now. Right. We will minister to others if we can put ourselves aside. And took away that selfishness that keeps us sometimes from doing what we know that God wants us to do and who He wants us to minister to. We've got to take and put it aside. And we've got to look towards Jesus. Amen. If we read this whole chapter, it would, it would talk about uh, the things that Jesus went through and how that His sacrifice is something that we should look at so that we will understand that our lives are not so bad because we have not yet resisted unto blood. Yes. As far as I know today, there's not, there's not a one of us that have been beaten up because we decided to live for God. Right. Right. Nobody's going to take you, hang you on a cross, or behead you. Or beat you for what you believe today. Say, what will we receive today? Well, a little bit of criticism. Yeah. yeah. What? You're a Christian? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. Yeah. Goes on to say in that second verse in the Amplified, it says, Who is the leader and the source? Of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief. Do you remember the first time that you felt God speak to you or call you? You may have originally thought it was my own thought, it was my own uh, direction of my thoughts, but it was Jesus walking by. It's me. Look into Jesus, the first incentive, the first thought for our faith. If you're looking at Jesus, you will surely find a place of repentance. If you're looking to Jesus, there will be no question about wanting to be baptized in his name. And if you're looking to Jesus, I know for a fact that he will fill you with the Holy Ghost. A childlike faith is unusual in our generation. Yeah. And yet Jesus said, except you become like one of these, you're perish. Right. Yeah. The child comes to an altar and just believes. Yeah. He doesn't need a great theological explanation what's right and what's wrong. He just believes. Sure. Jesus began that in each one of us. But he is also the finisher. Bringing it to maturity and perfection. Our faith. If you worry, how many of you worry sometimes if your faith is insufficient? Yeah. Worry that maybe you just don't have enough, you know, to get through this next struggle, or, or you don't have enough. Don't worry. Right. Keep your eyes on Him, because right. what He began in you, He is going to finish. Yeah. The faith that you feel is weak right now, tomorrow will be coming to a greater maturity. Yeah. The faith that you feel right now about the things that where's God, where God has brought you to going to be greater tomorrow than it is today. If we keep our eyes on Him. If we deliberately, intentionally take our eyes off all the things that would distract. And we look to Jesus. 
as it was with all the other different ways of looking at what we look at. There were some inevitable things that had happened for each one. For those of you that are looking towards him for, for everything he loves, it is inevitable that you will receive salvation. It is inevitable that one day, as we sang about, that we will be walking on the streets of gold. Yes. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Today, in this service, the end of it, if you found yourselves distracted, you found yourself just so busy with things in your life, why don't you make your way up to this altar and deliberately, intentionally, Stop looking at those things. Place your eyes, your mind, your attention on the one who is not only who has not only begun the process in our lives of salvation, but that the Bible promises us will finish. This altar is open if you would like to come.